let me share uh, the syllabus to tell you where we're at right now, just in case you haven't looked at it for a while. But this is the six week. And um, the tenth of this month is the last day to withdraw yourself without having to need a signature from me. So um, hopefully you don't have to do that. But if you have to, uh, make sure you do it before the 10th. And down the road on the 30th, if you drop the lab, then you must also have to drop the lecture. Okay, so um, FYI about those deadlines. Okay, now way down, way down in Thanksgiving, I noticed that I put in yellow there that we would move the lecture to a Wednesday. Now that's going to be dependent on how well we go along with the chapters. If we don't have to, uh, if we're going along pretty good with the chapters and we're ahead, and then maybe that Wednesday we can just drop it completely. Okay, but if not, just for the Thursday, just a reminder, you know, we're going to move it to a Wednesday because Thanksgiving is a holiday that Thursday, Friday. But we're going along pretty good, so I think we may we may end up having to uh, go ahead and drop it. But we'll wait till we get there. Okay. Now, someone had a question. Yeah, if you're not available, uh, again, uh, I'm going to be here. I'll talk about it. Um, but if you're not available, that's not a problem uh, because of the holiday and so forth. But um, I will record whatever I talk about, and you can view it later on. Okay, it will be recorded. Everything is recorded. I have uploaded everything that I recorded up there, you, and um, so don't forget about that. Also, too, on the course website, already recorded Dr. Tim's videos on each of the chapters here. You can view ahead of time to give you an alternative. Um, way of presenting the, the information for that particular ch chapter. Okay, any other questions about that? Well, we're moving along pretty good, so. Uh, I got one more. All right, so let's, let us continue. Oh, yes, uh, the exam, I have about maybe four or five more to finish grading for your group here. And I should knock that out in between my, my next uh, four, before my next 415. And then I will uh, open that exam up so you can view your answers and so forth this coming uh, uh, weekend. Okay. All right. But I'll send you an email about that. So. Okay. Well, we're get, moving along. So chapter eight, chapter eight is called nomenclature. Fancy name for name that compound. As we've been progressing and moving along the chapters, I've been throwing in names and talking about how there's a name change for the ion and so forth in preparation for this particular chapter. Because eventually what we want you to do is be able to look at a formula and uh, write the, write the uh, name for that compound and vice versa, given the formula name, write the formula, okay? So this, this is what this chapter is all about. Now, obviously for simple atoms, we just, we're gonna call them, these, these are the elements, and we talked about this at length. We got the sodium atom, neon atom. These are the neutral atoms. These do not have a charge, those are the elements. And they're neutral simply because they have an equal number of protons and electrons. Earlier, we give you a list, and so be familiar with the first 20. And, and, and here's a few more that you should be familiar with with respect to the name. We have Ba, which is barium. Co, down here at the bottom, is cobalt. I is iodine. Cu is copper. Fe is iron. Pb is lead. HD is mercury, AG is silver. The two get mixed up, so watch that carefully. HG is mercury, AG is silver. AU is gold, 
Again, Zn is zinc. Sn you might be familiar with because, you know, check the label on your toothpaste. You may be brushing your teeth with stannous fluoride, also called tin. So Sn could be given as stannous or tin. Those two names would be acceptable. The tin, T-I-N, is the most common name. Sr strontium. N I is nickel, B R is you know is bromine, C R is chromine, and there's another one that can get confusing. M N is manganese. Not too confused with M G, which is magnesium. Okay, and C D is cadmium. So uh, look up these names. Be familiar with the names. We'll be using them uh, along with some other ones too. Okay. Now we talked at length about ionic compounds. Remember the criteria for an ionic compound is a combination of a metal and a non-metal. That's, that's crucial. You got to recognize what is the metal. Go back to the uh, periodic table. Look at that little stair step on the periodic table. Anything to the left of that are metals. And uh, I don't want to say everything to the right because on the stair step, those are the metalloids. But to the right of the metalloids are the non-metals. Okay, so when you get a, you get a combination of a metal and a non-metal, we call that an ionic compound. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Covalent compounds are such compounds that we have two or more non-metals only. Another name that is used is molecular compounds. Okay, so things like carbon dioxide, we talked about that. H2O, good old-fashioned water. Okay through non-metals are covalent compounds. The other aspect to remember is the difference between the two bonds is in ionic compounds, we have a full-fledged charge, either a positive charge and or a negative charge, depending on the element, that are combined together. And they are attracted to each other, much like magnets are attracted to each other. They differ from covalent compounds in that when I put them in water to dissociate them, to dissolve them, they break apart into the relative different cation and anion. Covalent compounds, on the other hand, with the exception of acids, okay, that's, that's important, with the exception of acids like hydrochloric acid, okay, when we place those in water, they do not dissociate because that bond is a shared bond. Those are electrons that are being shared between two atoms. So there is no dissociation between the two, okay? With the exception of acids like phosphoric acid, hydrochloric acid, and, and we'll get to those. Those are the only exceptions. Now, <coughs> um, a quick word about monoatomic ions. Uh, there was a question about using the electron configuration or writing the electron configuration on the ion, and it depends on which one you got, There's different ones in the exam. Uh, people did very well with respect to giving the, the uh, electronic configuration, but they didn't realize that they were talking about the ion. And so a lot of answers gave the electron configuration of the element. And that is not correct because here, when it's an ion, remember it's either gonna gain or lose electrons. And therefore those valence electrons on the element itself are gone and they're no longer there. And so the next uh, um, level of electrons is the next one in, which is full in the octet, full with eight, eight, eight valence electrons, okay? And you, you'll see them written in sodium with a superscript, either plus charge or negative, negative charge. To distinguish these from the atoms, we call, we say sodium ion or the chloride, Cl negative, the chloride ion. That's compared to the atom where we add the word atom. Now, the other aspect of which I also mentioned is the nonmetals when, when they become ionic, we change the name. So chlorine, which is the element, once it, be, once it gains an electron, becomes the ion, its name changes chloride, okay? And that would be true for all the halides. 
Okay. So you're saying that with the, so this only happens with, with metals once they no. become ions, they, they go through the name change? Yeah. And this only happens with the non-metals. Oh, non-metals? Okay. Non-metals only. And I'll, I'll bring up the periodic table here in a second. And there's only a handful when you really think about it. So nitrogen, when it becomes an ion, now changes its name to nitride. Oxygen becomes oxide. What would sulfur be? Anyone, anybody want to take a chance, uh, guess at what its new name would be? Sulfide. Sulfide, exactly. And phosphorus becomes phosphide. Basically, we're adding the IDE extension. Okay? And that's only for the non metals. And so when you see the name written out, you know, sodium chloride, the name I chloride would tell you, I am dealing with. Ionic chlor uh, chlorine, not chlorine, the element. Okay. With respect to the metals, the name stays the same. Sodium, be it an atom, an element, or being an ion, remains sodium, name wise. Now, the polyatomic ions. On the periodic table, left hand corner, there is a listing of a number of polyatomic ions. These are uh, atoms that are combined, two or more atoms. They're combined together, they have an overall charge. So down in the bottom left of the slide, you see PO4 negative three, okay? That is called the phosphate. And that whole unit has a negative three charge. Now, they stay together. So whenever we need to use more than one polyatomic ion, we essentially put a parentheses around it and then we use a subscript outside the parentheses to tell us that we have two or more. So you may need one. If you need one, no parentheses. But if you need two or more, we put a parentheses around that whole polyatomic ion. Okay? And that name doesn't change. That is the name for that ion, phosphate. The next one in, the OH minus, that's called the hydroxyl. Okay? That's its own specific name. So you can combine the sodium ion on top with the hydroxide, for example. If I take the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion and I combine them, I make a compound uh, called NaOH or sodium hydroxide, okay? But we're gonna get into the putting them together here in a bit to make formulas. So now I've been using the term charge, but your, your book uses uh, a term what's called oxidation state. Don't let that confuse you. An oxidation state is nothing more than the charge. So for example, the sodium ion has plus one charge. If you're asked what is the oxidation state of the sodium ion, it's a plus one. Okay. So but the term oxidation number or oxidation state or charge is used interchangeably. You'll hear that pop up in your, in your textbook and even in the lecture slides here, okay? We all know again that all elements have zero charge simply because they have an equal number of protons and equal number of electrons. And they have a zero, zero charge or a zero oxidation state, okay? Now, again, we know that ions are either going to be gaining or losing electrons to form cations or anions. Now, I'm going to show you a periodic table here. And if you have your periodic table, you may want to mark it up in a similar, similar state. Now, we have, a, we have all these metals here. Here's a stair step. To the left of the stair step are the metals, okay? Now, you know the oxidation state of 16, or will know, of 16 metals. Column one, or group one, are all the metals that are starting with lithium down to FR, okay? They all have one valence electron. Every element there, all six of them in group one, will always, always, 100% of the time, have a plus one charge, okay? In group two, you have another six elements. When they become 
cations always 100% of the time will have a plus two charge, okay? Now I'm gonna give you four more. So if you count those first two columns, that's 12. That they have, you know, it's oxidation state 100% of the time. I circled aluminum, number 13. Aluminum always has a plus three state, uh, oxidation state or charge. Zinc always has a plus two, 100% of the time. Silver always has a plus one, and cadmium CD always has a plus two. So there you go, you have 16 elements that you know its oxidation state 100% of the time, okay? The other element, the other metals in there vary. For example, copper can have a plus one or a plus two charge, okay? And the question is, well, how do we distinguish between a plus one and a plus two? This is where we use Roman numerals. Roman numerals, do not to be confused with the Roman numerals on top of the group, okay? These Roman numerals are used to identify the oxidation state of the metal that has a variable oxidation state. So therefore, if I wanted to deal with copper two, you would see it written as uh, C U, oh, little U, sorry, parentheses I I Roman numeral. Okay. And that tells me that I am working with copper plus two charge. Okay, how do I know it's plus two? Because it's a metal. Remember I told you, all metals lose electrons, therefore always have a plus oxidation state. And if I've wanted to distinguish copper one, I would use a Roman numeral one in parentheses, okay? And that's how we distinguish it too, because there's no ambiguity between them. It, they used to have their special name, cuprous and cupric, and that was kind of ambiguous. And so it was decided, let's just use Roman numerals and there's no question. Other examples would be iron. Iron can exist in a plus three stage. Therefore, you'll see it with Roman numeral three. And it also can exist in a plus two stage, okay? So those Roman numerals right after the symbol of the metal either the name of the metal or the symbol of the metal tells you the oxidation state that you are working with, okay? All right, so you got the 16, I call it the sweet 16. You know that 100% what their oxidation state. Those guys, those 16 do not require a Roman numeral to distinguish it as far as the charge because they always have a constant oxidation state, okay? So I would never say uh, sodium parentheses, uh, parentheses Roman numeral one, because it's understood that always sodium has a plus one. Okay. All right. So uh, let's head back to the slide. And that's what we mean by variable charge. Okay, you will always be told which one you're working with by the Roman numeral. So you got 16 of them that you know 100% of the time. I can use that information to determine the oxidation state of its partner. Okay, because I'm going to give you a general formula. In fact, I gave it to you before where it said the number of cations plus the number of anions in this case would equal zero. I'm going to expand on that here in a bit. Okay. So we know about cations. We know we went over to group 1A, group 2A, group 3A, and what their charge would be, okay? Because the group number ha actually helps you to determine their charge because that's how many valence electrons they have with respect to metals, and that's the ultimate loss of those electrons, which give you the, the um, oh, hold on one second. And so this is the rehash of what we've been dealing with, the periodic table and the oxidation state. And so I gave you the 16. 
That means that all the other metals, they could vary from a plus one to a plus nine. And, you know, it depends on the reaction conditions. But you'll be told which ones you work with. For example, I talked about copper and iron, but lead, ionic lead can exist as a plus four charge. Okay? And we will use the Roman numeral four to distinguish the fact that that's the ion that we need to work with. Okay. The nonmetals, we, we talked at length about that, depending on what group they're in. The, the group five will always have a negative three. Group six always have a negative two. And group one will always have a negative one for the nonmetals. And obviously the, the noble gases are, will never have a charge. They're just inert and never react, okay? Because of their octet fulfillment and helium with its duet fulfillment. Now, we're going to begin by learning the formulas and the names for ionic compounds. Okay. Now, remember that ionic compounds are made of ions and ions have a charge. Okay. And the sum of the charges must equal zero. Okay. So, let me do this. And I wrote this before, but the number of cations plus the number of anions. In the beginning here, we're going to equal to zero. Okay, we want to put enough cations and enough anions together so the charges equal up, uh, cancel out. Now, I'm going to change this a little bit. Instead of saying zero, I'm going to say the overall charge of the, uh, in this case, ion. Okay. Using that general formula, we can figure out the charge of a particular atom within a component. And I have that. On, and that bottom formula also, uh, I shouldn't say I am, maybe the best thing would be compound. Okay. Which could be an overall ion, okay? So the number of cations plus the number of anions equals the overall charge of the compound which nine times out of 10 is zero. But there are there is some homework uh, examples where the overall compound is not zero and is equal to some other number, but you can still calculate it. And we'll, we'll get some of those examples here. I'll run through those. Oh, let me. All right. And so um, polyatomic ions, Okay, here's that table. I talked briefly about these. These are polyatomic ions, <clears throat> each with their own uh, charge or oxidation state given there by the superscript. Could be anywhere from a negative one to a, a negative three. Uh, the only cation that we really work with a lot is the ammonium, the NH4 plus, okay? But even with that, you can combine that ammonium with any of these anions, and you have already a number of compounds. For example, I can combine ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrite, ammonium sulfate, ammonium sulfite, ammonium phosphate, ammonium chromate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So right now you're probably up to, plus all the ions and monoatomic ions, you're probably up to about three, 400 compounds that you can put together, okay? Because I can easily substitute any of the other uh, monoatomic uh, ions like copper and sodium, I said sodium, but potassium, any of them, and make a combination of all kinds of compounds. Okay. Thing to, refer, uh, to remember is these polyatomic ions are kept as a unit. And we use parentheses to show that we need to, when we need two or more. We don't change the 
the atom number. We don't change the subscript. We put a parenthesis around it and put a subscript around the parenthesis to tell us how many we need. All right, so in this initial scenario, all the compounds must be zero. So we could add enough cations and enough anions to equal zero. So let's combine the ions of sodium and nitrogen. Okay, first thing we're going to do, they might just throw you that question, combine sodium and nitrogen. We need to uh, determine what the ion is for each of the elements. We know that sodium is part of the 316, right? It's in group one, it's gonna be a plus one charge. And we know that nitrogen is in group five, and when it becomes ionic, it will have a negative three charge. So you can see here that I only have one sodium and with a plus charge and a negative three. So therefore I need three sodium ions, okay? I need three to, oh, a bad color there. I need three sodiums for every nitride. And so here is where that three now becomes a subscript. So I can write the formula as Na subscript three and uh, the nitrogen, or in this case, the nitride. <clears throat> that would be the formula for the combination of sodium ion and the nitride ion. What about the name? Anybody want to name that compound, Na3N? So would that be sodium nitride? Is that good? Sodium nitride. Okay. Now we could easily substitute the nitride to sulfide. Sulfide has a negative two. And so therefore we, the formula will be Na2S because we would need two, only two sodiums in that scenario. Okay. And that, that's an example here. So what is the formula? We got sodium and, and sulfur, convert them to ions. So like, like the previous example is the plus one. Sulfur, knowing that is in group six, becomes negative two. So we can combine that to write the formula of Na2S. The name would be sodium sulfide, okay? And So I, I would first convert to my ions. Okay, the sodium ion. And then I know that the sulfide is a negative two. And so once I got the ions and I look at the charges, I know that I need a two sodiums for each sulfide. Okay, hence my formula now, that two in front of my ion becomes a subscript. So now the formula becomes Na subscript two, and the name is simply sodium because the name for the metal is not change, but the sulfur, once it becomes the ion, and now we change the name to sulfide. So its name would be sodium sulfide. So you might be given the name sodium sulfide, give me the formula or given the formula and figure out what the name is. Okay. So, so how do we know right off the bat that sulfur is a neg uh, has a negative two charge? How, okay. do, how do we do that right off the bat? Okay, who could answer that question? Question, how do we know that sulfur has a negative two charge? A good question, who can answer that? Yeah. Periodic table, do you know, do you see where sulfur is? Yeah, it's off to the right. It's just under oxygen. Yeah, what number is number 16, right? You see what group it's in? It's in a... Uh, six. Six. Six, exactly. 
Now that's elemental sulfur. When so is it a metal or non-metal? It's a non-metal. Okay, so would it gain or lose electrons? It would gain. Gain. Now how many would it gain based on its group number? Oh, okay, okay. All right, I got gotcha. you. It would it, you got it, it? Gain. it would gain two. It would gain it, it would gain two. The same would be true for, for oxygen and selenium below it. Everybody in group six, all non-metals being in group six, will always have a negative two. When we look okay. at nitrogen, right? Nitrogen is in group five. It's a non-metal. It's going to gain electrons. And because it's a group five, it can pick up three electrons, hence the negative three. All the halides, and that would be true for... Uh, uh, your audio. Is anybody else's audio breaking up? I'm hearing fine. Okay, everybody's okay. So you might check, you might, uh, Abel, you might check your connection maybe. Okay, so everybody in group seven would have. Um, a negative one charge. So the fluorine becomes fluoride, chlorine becomes chloride, bromine becomes bromide, iodine becomes iodide. All of them with a negative one charge. Okay? Does that help out? And clarify it? So always, when you're not sure, that's why I keep, I keep pointing to the product table because the product table is just loaded with a bunch of information based on where the element is. Okay, all right, so let's go back to where we were. And so here we have magnesium and we have oxygen, okay? And so first things first, before I even put it together, I first determine what the ion is. I look, look for magnesium in the product table, it's in group two, and guess what? It will have what kind of charge? Plus, oh, not an equal to, but a plus two charge, okay? That's my symbol for superscript. And oxygen, like we just did with, with uh, uh, the other non-metals, is in group six, okay? Is in group six, and then uh, meaning that it would have a negative two charge. So I got my ions together, okay? Now I gotta figure out, I gotta make sure I add enough of each to cancel out the charges that each one brings in. And fortunately in this case, both of them are, are the same charge, plus two, negative two. So I can very quickly just simply write out the formula as MgO. What will be the name of MgO? Magnesium oxide? Exactly. Magnesium oxide. Okay. And then here we got a little bit of more of a bit of a challenge, but still the same. Break it down stepwise, you know, the, you know, you break it down systematically and look at the elements that you have. You got potassium. Potassium again is in group one. So we know the ion is going to be a plus one, correct? I mean, and then we look at phosphorus. Well, phosphorus, where's phosphorus? It is right under nitrogen, okay, group five. So phosphorus becomes ionic when we'll end up with a negative three charge, just like nitrogen, okay? And then knowing that, it now becomes ionic, you think about the, the name change. So that being the case here, that's I got my ions set up, so I need, three potassiums to cancel the negative three charge of the phosphide ion, okay? So now I can put them together, that three in front of potassium ion becomes a subscript. So I need three potassiums and one phosphorus. In this case, it's called phosphide. So its name is potassium phosphide. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's another one, a bit of more challenge, but work it, break it down stepwise. 
Okay. First, we bring it in, make it into ions. What kind of ion? What is the oxidation state of the calcium ion? Plus two. You got it. Plus two. Okay. Now, what about the nitrogen? We we did we did that earlier. Negative three. You got it. Negative three. Now, the previous examples. Okay. The previous examples, we had an even, you know, not even, like magnesium oxide, we just put them together. The sodium sulfide, we knew we needed two sodiums. But here we got a little bit of a challenge. I have a plus two on, carb, on uh, calcium and a negative three on nitrogen. How can I put these two together in such a way that the overall charge gets canceled? Wouldn't you have to do like extreme multiples of both in order to for them to have a number that they're di uh, divisible by? Exactly. And any suggestions? Uh, well, they're both. They can both go into six. Okay. So they can both go into six. Mean meaning that I need in, uh, I need enough positive. Uh, calciums to tally up to six. So how many would that be? You need three of those? I need three of those, right? And how many of the nitrides would I need to tally up to six? Two. Exactly, two. And so here when I have an odd number, I need to find a common denominator like you do in, in algebra, okay? And the common, de or, or, or when you're trying to add the fractions, for example, like one fourth plus one fifth, I got to find a common denominator. One fourth plus one fifth common denominator would be 20. So I would need to convert the one fourth into units of 20 and, and one fifth the same. Here, our common denominator is six. And so I got to add enough of the positives to add up to six and enough of the negatives to add up to six. Normally, I can find a common denominator by just multiplying the two numbers, two and three, and I got six, okay? And so, with that being said, putting it together like I just did, and now I can write the formula because I need three calciums and two nitrogens. Now, there's a little, do you see a little trend here or do you see something that might help you to figure out when you got something like this, I want you to think about this. All right. The oxidation state of the cation, which is the calcium, becomes a subscript of the anion, right? Did, did, not, oxid, uh, did not calcium have a plus two? Look at that. It's the superscript plus two. Another, another thing to observe. The oxidation state of the anion, which, which is the nitride, was the negative three, now becomes the subscript of the cation. You basically crossed over the charges for the subscript. Okay? And if you, you don't see that, that's fine. Break it down in the ions, find a common number, and then uh, uh, those common numbers find enough positive, enough negatives, and those numbers become the subscript. Let me clear this up. All right, so now let's do another one. All right, so here we have aluminum. Oh, what would be the name of number four? Calcium nitride. So notice something. We didn't introduce any Roman numerals. Why is that? Uh, because we already know the charges of these. Right. Those. All those metals belong to the sweet 16. Those are constant charges. Therefore, we don't need to be adding any Roman numerals. Okay, aluminum also is part of that 16. And we know that aluminum has a plus three, okay? And so I break it down again to the ions. So we got aluminum with a plus three. It's in group three. Three valence electrons, it's a metal, it's going to lose those electrons. 
and the chloride, chlorine is in group seven, when it becomes ionic, is gonna pick up one electron, okay? And so now we have the chlorides written down. Next thing we do, we check to make sure we got enough of each. I got a plus three, I got a negative one. I need three chlorides to counter the plus three of aluminum. That being said, once I figure out how many ions of each I need, and those numbers become subscript for the formula. So the name here would be simply aluminum chloride. Zinc, part of the 16 again, always has a plus two. Iodide, part of the halogens, group seven, always has a negative one. So I got a plus two and a negative one. Okay, I need two, I need two iodides to give me the formula for zinc iodide. Yeah. If you don't see it, break it down again into the ions, zinc has a plus two, the iodines have a negative one, that becomes, I need two iodides per one zinc plus two ion, so my formula becomes as shown there. Okay, all right, now we got a little bit of a challenge. What does that Roman numeral tell you there? That's telling you it's, it's uh, I'm assuming temporary charge, right? No, not temporary, that's the charge. Remember I, I went through the periodic table and I, and I showed the 16 that always have a constant, constant uh, oxidation number. And then I said, that means that everybody else has a variable number. And in order for us to distinguish which one it is, we use Roman numerals. So the Roman numeral two pertains to the copper ion being utilized here. So that Roman numeral two tells you that you have a, the plus two, oh, the plus two ion, okay? Not a temporary charge. That is the charge of the ion that you're working with. Because remember that copper is not part of the 16. So we don't know for sure what charge it would be. We have to be told that, okay? And oxygen is in group six. When it becomes ionic, it will pick up. Is that correct? No. No, what? what? Wait, 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 wait. No, that, no, it should be negative two, right? You got it. All right, that should be negative two. I'm just checking to see anybody's reading. <laughs> All right, so yes, it's, it's a negative two because it's in group six and it becomes ionic and we pick up two electrons, okay? And so now those are our ions that we got to work with. And so now we put them together, it's a straightforward one-to-one -one because they have equal charges, okay? And that's our formula. Now, how do I name that compound? How do I uh, name? I, I naturally, CuO? I naturally want to say copper oxide, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Well, that's fifty percent right. <laughs> okay, that's fifty percent right. So, how can I get the other fifty percent right? Because there's there's two types of copper, and both of them have the, the name copper oxide. So how do I distinguish between the two? It's written right there in front of you. By, by putting in the Roman numeral two. You got it, you got it. So we got copper, oh, not Cooper. Copper Roman numeral two oxide, okay? Copper Roman numeral two oxide. So that would be the name of that compound. So using the Roman numerals and full names written out tells us what ion of copper you're working with. Because the other type of copper is Roman numeral one. Copper one oxide, you can have that too. So the parent name for both 
copper one and copper two is copper oxide. How we distinguish between which oxidation state is using the Roman numeral. And this, this formula here would be copper Cu Nessa subscript O. That would be the formula for copper one oxide because we need two coppers to counter the negative two charge of the oxygen. All right, let's see. <clears throat> All right, here we got another example of Roman numeral. What does that IV represent? Uh, four. Oh, so what, kind, what kind of four though? Uh, that would be a positive four. Exactly. It's a metal, so it's always going to be a positive four. Okay, so we're, we're dealing with positive four. What's the name of PB? Anybody know? Lead. Lead. So we're dealing with positive four ion. Okay, and the oxide again is a negative one. And therefore, I need to put them together such that the overall charge equals zero. So that being the case, since the oxygen is a negative two, I need two oxides to counter the plus four of lead. Okay. And the name then would be lead, Roman numeral four, oxide. Oh, I'm running out of space there. Okay, here's the formula. Lead Roman numeral four oxygen. Now, let me do an example here of uh, let's work it backwards. A question here. Okay. Yeah, you, you practice this like in math. It makes makes perfect. Um, okay, let's work backwards. I give you the name cobalt Roman numeral two chloride. Can you write the formula? Where do I start? Okay. What can I do first? Probably start with the chloride first, right? Well, you, you, that helps. Yeah, you can start with the chloride. What would, I, what would I do with the chloride? Um, I gotta write. I gotta write the formula. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe. I'm not really sure. I'm not used to working. Okay. Backwards. All right. <laughs> So go from left to right, cobalt. The first thing I need is a symbol. Anybody know what the symbol for cobalt is? CO. CO. Yeah, capital CO, okay. And then the Roman numeral tells me what? It tells me the charge. Yeah, which is what kind of charge? That one would be a plus two. You got it, plus two. Okay, so I just I deciphered the name. Now I wrote from the name given. I I wrote now the ion. Okay, so I'm working backwards. We we were given the uh, the atoms now before. Wrote the ions and then put them together to make the, the formula. So now I got the and then work with some of the names. Now I'm giving you the name and work backwards to write the formula. So cobalt two, I gotta find the symbol for cobalt with the CO, okay, plus two. What about the chloride? We know that Cl, but what kind of charge does it have? Negative one. Exactly, negative one. And so here, now I got cobalt brings a positive two, chloride is a negative one, 
I need two chlorides, correct? Everybody see that? I need two chlorides to cancel out the positive two. So therefore my formula would be CO, CL, and that subscript, unfortunately I can't do that, subscript two, okay? And that is the formula for the name given. CO, CL2, all right. Now, let's say, for example, you're given that formula. Work just given the formula and you want to give the name. Well, you might be given the simple formula COCl2, and the first thing you got to do is what is the oxidation state of cobalt? Okay, because it's not part of the 16, so I'm going to have to use a Roman numeral number. But if I work backwards, I know that each chloride is a negative one, and there's two of them. And knowing the formula that the number of cations must equal the number of anions, the cobalt has to be a plus two. Isn't it true? Because I know that if I don't know what the cobalt is, but I do know that there's uh, a, a, a negative two for the chlorides, and that has to equal zero. So working backwards and solving for cobalt, cobalt becomes a plus. It oxidation state for that formula is a plus two. Okay. It has to be a plus two. Yeah, and you see how we can work backwards? So sometimes you're given the formula, but you don't know one of the metals that could be a variable metal, oxidation state variable. And you need to figure out, well, which one am I working with? You will always know the, the oxidation state of one of either the cation and the anion. And knowing one or the other, you can work backwards to figure out what that one you don't know is as far as its oxidation state. Okay, let me, let me, let me do this one here. Um, What will be the oxidation state of FeCl2? Um, well, I, I know the, uh, the uh, charge for the Cl, but you'd have to work backwards for the Fe, right? Okay, what is the charge for the chlorides? Uh, the chlorides would be a negative one. And, and how many do you have? There's two of them. Okay, and so you have Fe plus the negative two must equal zero, right? So what must Fe be? Uh, positive two. You got it. And so Fe in this scenario must be a positive two. It has to be because it has to it has to cancel out the negative charge for the chlorides. So this example is how you know you know the oxidation state of the anion to calculate the oxidation state of the cation. Okay. Now, can anybody? Let's, let's take it one step further, and we're going to use nonmetals for a second. This is carbon dioxide. Can somebody tell me the oxidation state of, the, of this carbon or this formula? See, carbon uh, CO2. Using the same sequence of what we just did. The oxidation state of the, car of the carbon plus the oxidation state of the oxygens must equal zero. What must be the oxidation state of carbon in carbon dioxide? One. One? Okay, well, let's work it through. Carbon, we don't know, we're looking for that, okay? Plus, what do we know about oxygen? Its oxidation state, be it combined covalent or be it combined ionic, what is its charge? 
Negative two. Negative two, exactly. And how many do we have? Two. 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 So what's our total negative? Negative four. Negative four. You, you got it. Negative four. Okay. And that has to equal to zero. So what must carbon be? Positive four. You got it. Okay. So carbon, when it's carbon dioxide, must have an oxidation state of a positive four, which is consistent with its position on our periodic table. Because remember, carbon is in group four, and it has a capability of either losing all four electrons or gaining four electrons. In this scenario, it lost all four electrons. Okay. So the point of that, of this here, is that the oxidation state, be it in ionic form, meaning a metal, non metal, or being in a covalent form, two non metals, is the same. Okay. So oxygen will always have a negative two, be it in molecular covalent form or in, say, magnesium oxide form, example number two we just did. All right. Yeah, let me clear this mess up a little bit. All right, so every time you put metal and non-metals together, make sure you, you, you check the charges, make sure they cancel out. And the same is true for uh, um, covalent compounds. Now, formula for polyatomic ions, here we got a little bit, a little bit different now. We're dealing with polyatomic ions. And I can't overemphasize that periodic table from the periodic table down at the bottom left. Okay. So obviously you have access to this when you're uh, doing your homework and your exams. So you always can very quickly find that information. So you got magnesium and then they tell you that OH negative. So that's a hint to tell you it's a polyatomic ion. So you look it up and its name is, is uh, hydroxide. Now we got to write the form, we got to write the ions first. So first things first, you're given the anion already. So you got to work on the magnesium. So what is the, what is the oxidation state of the magnesium ion? Plus two. You got it, plus two. And the hydroxide is given to you has got a negative one, okay? And so that means that I need two of them, but I need to put a parenthesis around them because I need two of those hydroxide ions to counter the positive two of the magnesium ion. And so that being the case, let me clear that so it looks so messy. That is my formula. I got the hydroxy ion in parentheses. It will be incorrect to put O2H2 because that is some other compound. I don't know what it is. I don't think it even exists. So for polyhydroxy ions, you want to put a parenthesis around the whole unit and it, then use a subscript. Okay, so and its name will be magnesium hydroxide. Okay, this could have been calcium. Calcium could be used, same scenario, you get Ca, uh, calcium hydroxide. Th that's the active ingredient, ingredient, ingredient in, in Tom's. All right, now here we have this one. We have potassium and then they give you the PO4 minus three. Again, you may be asked to figure out the name. So you go through the periodic table and look for the PO4 minus three and there it is down here, okay? That is called phosphate, okay? The phosphate ion. So remembering that, you go back to it, got a negative three. We know that potassium has a plus one. So I'm gonna need three potassiums to cancel out the negative three for the phosphate ion. And so, my formula is this, uh, I don't put a parenthesis around the PO4 simply because I only need one. And, you know, it's understood it's there. So you don't need a parenthesis around it. If you put it around it, that's 
I would take it, but um, it's just normally by by convention, you, you don't put a parenthesis around the polyatomic ion that when you only need one. And its name here would be potassium phosphate. Potassium phosphate. There's, a, there's another polyatomic ion, a SO4 negative two, okay. That is called the sulfate. If you look at the polyatomic ion table, that is the sulfate. Not to be confused with sulfide. Okay, there is a big difference. Okay, when so you with, have the, go ahead. So, so it's it's kind of the same way like we were doing before with the other with the, the ionic uh -huh. compound. Um, so it's pretty much the, the subscripts are switching. Uh, well, no, 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 we're, we're either the subscript, either the only thing to remember is for polyatomic ion, whenever you need more than one, and I'm, I'm gonna have an example of that here in a sec. Well, we did one up there with hydroxide. I need right. more than one hydroxide. So I'm, I use a, a parenthesis around the polyatomic ion with the subscript. Okay. Because, okay. And so we're, the only difference between this and what we did before is here we have to use a parenthesis only around the poly, uh, polyatomic ions when you need two or more. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So here, uh, remember we got, uh, let's, let's do a quick thing. We know that the symbol S is simply sulfur. Okay. And then when it becomes ionic, it becomes sulfide. Now we have the SO, oh, SO4, subscript 4. And bear with me. I wish they'd give you, they'd give you a superscript here. But that's SO4 oxygen subscript. That's that polyatomic ion there on the board with the negative charge. And that is called sulfate. Okay. And if you look at that uh, table again, you'll see another one with three oxygens instead of four, but the same charge. And that is called sulfite. Okay. And so all of them have sulfur. The element is sulfur. When it becomes ionic, it becomes name becomes sulfide. But then if we combine the sulfur with oxygen, specifically four of them to make a polyatomic ion with a negative two charge, that whole unit is called sulfate. And then uh, we use one less oxygen to become sulfite, okay? Very similar to the other one, nitrate, nitrite and nitride, nitrogen. You got nitrogen, nitride, nitrate, and nitrite. Very, very similar. So um, if you're given the name and they say, uh, write, the for write the formula for sodium sulfate, ATE tells you the ATE, I, I'm working with the polyatomic ion. And don't confuse that with sodium sulfide, where you're working with just the ionic uh, element of sulfur. Okay, so here we, we got silver and uh, the sulfate. We know that silver is part of the 16, plus it has a constant oxidation number of plus one, and the sulfate has a negative two, so we need two silvers and only one SO4. So this name will be uh, silver sulfate, okay? I have a question. Would you still accept it if we put the parentheses around the silver? Right, uh, around the silver, you do, yeah, I'll accept it. You don't really need it because there's nothing else around that by okay. convention, okay? Because if there was something else in front of it, you would need a, even at that, uh, um, let me restate that. When it's the monatomic 
element itself, you generally don't need a parentheses, only for the polyatomic ions when you need two or more. You notice the first one up there, we needed two hydroxides, so we had a parentheses with a substrate of two. The second example, we only needed one PO4, so we don't need a parentheses there. The same is true for SO4, okay? And the, the monoatomic, if you need more than one, uh, you generally don't put a parenthesis. If you put one in, I'll, I'll take it, not a problem. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, so here we have calcium, which we know is in group two, which the uh, ion would be a plus two. And in this case, we have the NO3 negative which is the nitrate. Well, let's go back to the table. Let's go find it. Okay, we have, here it is right there. Oh, the NO3 negative, that is the nitrate polyatomic ion. The one below it, one less oxygen is called the nitrite. So going back, the calcium has a plus one, plus two, excuse me. That means we need two nitrates. So we put a parenthesis with the subscript. Okay. So that parenthesis tells you you have two nitrogens and a, a total of two nitrogens and six oxygens. Okay. Here's, here's a little bit of a, remember what the copper Roman numeral two meant? meant that I had a part, uh, positive charge of two. You got it. I mean, you're working with a positive two ion. And then the, the CO3 negative two is the carbonate. Okay. And so again, if you, you can look up that name in the polyatomic ion. And so here the form is because simply it's a one to one here with this or two to two. So we just need one of each. So the formula is formula CuCO3. Uh, now, what if I had to name that formula? What if I had to write out the name? It would have to be copper to carbonate. You write it copper, Roman numeral two, carbonate. Okay, and that would be the name. And sometimes you're given the name, you got to work backwards to write the formula. Okay, so the point of, uh, point of the polyatomic ions is just to remember to use the parentheses if you use more than one polyatomic ion, okay? And if you write it around the monoatomic ion, that's fine, I will accept that. Um, but normally by default, yeah, um, it, it, it is not, by convention is not for that here, for example, if you put parentheses, parentheses around that, I would take it, but by conventions, it's not generally done. All right, let's name them now. So we got to start working with formulas. I'm gonna start working with uh, naming, the, naming the compounds. So, and I've already introduced you to a lot of the naming aspects of it, okay? Now, the thing to remember now, the fixed charge metals, the sweet 16, we don't use Roman numerals. Okay? Everything else, all the other metals require Roman numerals. And so, um, at length, I've talked about the name change of the nonmetals, where the I and E becomes IDE for chlorine to chloride, bromine to bromide, you know, the oxygen becomes oxide, so on and so forth. Okay, so the name here would be simply so sodium chlorine. It wouldn't be sodium chlorine because just by the name chlorine tells you you're dealing with the element and we're not dealing with the element. The fact that there's sodium written first followed by Cl tells you it is an ionic compound. Okay, it is not, you're not dealing with uh, chlorine. Oh, what about this one? Who, who can name this guy? 
ABR. No, the person needs to find be, out. What, uh, go ahead. Would that be potassium bromide? Exactly. Potassium brom bromide. Wouldn't be bromine, again, because it, first of all, it's only one BR. Okay, so that should tell you, okay, it's, we're not dealing with the elements. And second of all, there's a metal right in front written first. By convention, uh, the when we have compounds, what you generally find is the metal is written first or the symbol is given first, followed by the non-metal. So you always find the metal first. It'd be potassium, magnesium, calcium, what have you. Okay, so here is potassium bromide. What about this one? In fact, we did this one earlier. This one was magnesium oxide. Okay. Now notice we're not using Roman numerals again because these potassium magnesium are part of the 16. There's, they have a constant oxidation state. What about this one? CAF2. Anybody want to take a shot at it? Uh, calcium fluoride. Calcium fluoride, exactly. Now you might be confused. Well, wait a minute, there's a subscript too. Why isn't that calcium fluorine? Well, it couldn't be. Why? Because right in front, you have a metal, calcium, CA followed by the F. So that it, again indicates it's an ionic compound. The fact, why is it that we have two fluor fluorides? Because the calcium has a positive charge of one. And the, well, the, or no, it has a positive charge of two, and the, you got it. and the fluorine has a, a, a negative charge of one. You got it. That's correct. Because calcium is in group two when it comes an ion, it becomes a plus two charge. And fluoride, the fluorides in group seven, they have a negative charge. And okay? so you need two of them. Okay, here's another one. What about this one? L I LI2S. Who wants to shout at that? Would that be a lithium sulfide? Lithium sulfide. Not to be confused with sulfate, right? Because the sulfate will have the oxygen right after the sulfur, the polyatomic ion. So it's sulfur all by itself. So it's just simply the sulfide. Okay, lithium sulfide. And then here, this one is pretty straightforward, silver chloride. Okay, so notice for all ionic compounds, two things to remember, okay? Once you identify the formula, or the, the, or the name as an, an ionic compound, we don't use prefixes like di, tri, so on and so forth. Like for example, carbon dioxide. Oh, I got a couple questions here. We say carbon dioxide. Oh, one minute warning. Yeah, you're right. Okay, all right. So when you deal with ionic compounds, no prefixes. So we wouldn't say calcium difluoride for number three up here. It'd be simply calcium fluoride. Nor would we say dilithium sulfide, okay? Unless you're a Star Trek and it's dilithium crystals, but that's a whole new story, okay? <laughs> okay, that's something else. So all ionic compounds, no prefixes. When we get to covalent compounds, this is where we start introducing prefixes, okay? And remember, be able to distinguish between an ionic, an ionic compound and a covalent compound or molecular compound, okay? Yeah, get those two, you know, in long-term memory because then that information will tell you if I use prefixes or not. The other aspect about the ones with the 16 with the constant charge, the, the sweet 16, no Roman numerals, which tells you that 
all the other metals have Roman numerals because their oxidation state is very low. Okay. Anyway, so let me stop it in here. Stop it here, page uh, 13. And um, we'll stop recording.